So a couple of years ago, I did a video where I showed you guys a few different mods that you could do to an original Game Boy Advance to give it some features that we've come to take for granted in modern devices. Things like a backlit screen and a USB rechargeable battery. Yeah, I know, it's hard to imagine a device these days without those things. Well, since then, there have been a lot of new and improved mods and custom parts and things like that that have come out. So I wanted to revisit that idea with the Game Boy Advance SP. And this time, I wanted to go all out and cram as much stuff as I could in there to really create the ultimate modernized Game Boy. Okay, so let me run down the features on this thing real quick. Got a gorgeous machined aluminum shell with matching buttons, which converts it from the clamshell form factor of the SP to a more traditional Game Boy type body. This thing is awesome and it feels incredible to play on. Then there's a modern IPS based display. Huge upgrade there, it gets super bright and has great viewing angles. A USB type C charging on the back. Headphone jack on the front because yeah, the original Game Boy Advance SP didn't have that. Massive battery inside there that can last over 15 hours with low screen brightness, an overclocking board that lets you speed up and slow things down with a button combination, and to top it all off, wireless charging. Now, I can already hear some of you out there saying, what is the point of this when there are so many good options for emulation? I mean, you've got Raspberry Pi based handhelds, tons of great options from Chinese companies like Ambernic, or even emulating other systems on a hacked console like a PS Vita. So yeah, with so many great options for emulation, why even bother with original hardware anymore? For a lot of people, a large component of it is just nostalgia. Even though we swapped out the screen in the shell to where it's not even recognizable as a Game Boy Advance anymore, knowing that at its core is still running original hardware, and you can take your original cartridges that maybe even have a save game from when you were a kid on it, and still play those things, there's just something special about that. It's also a great way that you can take an old system that maybe is broken, maybe the screen doesn't work anymore, broken hinge or something like that, and make it usable again while at the same time updating and modernizing it. But there are a couple of more practical reasons why you might want to use original hardware. You don't have to worry about compatibility or performance or anything like that. Any game that you take and stick in there, it's gonna work exactly as it was intended to. You also don't have to worry about any of the games that have special hardware inside the cartridges. For example, a couple of games had accelerometers inside the cartridge so that you could tilt the system to control it. Some games had a real-time clock inside of them. And there were even a couple of games that had light sensors inside the cartridge that would change the gameplay depending on the ambient light levels. So even if this project doesn't make much sense to you, if it's not your thing, you gotta admit there are some pretty good reasons why some people might wanna stick with original hardware. I'm going to show you how to do each one of these mods, so this is going to be a longer video, but I'll put timestamps in the description to jump to each one. I'll also put a link in the description to a blog post that has a list of all of the parts and tools that I'm using, so definitely check that out if you plan on doing any of these. Also, if you're new to soldering or if that part intimidates you, first of all, seriously, you don't need to worry, it's not nearly as bad as you might be thinking. Um, and I'll put a link in the description to a soldering crash course video that I did not too long ago uh, to help you get up to speed there. Also, if you plan on doing any of these mods or if you've got other projects that you're working on that maybe you just wanna show off or get help with, we've got a Discord server that I will drop a link to in the description as well. All right, so with all that out of the way, let's get started. Okay, so here are all the different parts that I'm gonna be using in this build. First up, I've got this shell from BoxyPixel. Absolutely gorgeous, machined out of solid aluminum and feels really comfortable to play on. Uh, I've just been blown away by the quality of this stuff. He makes shells for all kinds of different systems as well, uh, including this one for Kite's Circuit Shield board, which I've been meaning to put together for ages, uh, as well as stuff like shells for Joy-Cons and things like that. So definitely give him a follow to see what he's up to. I did run into a few minor issues as I was putting it together. Um, none of them are deal breakers though, and I'll show you those as they come up. I've got some buttons to go along with that shell. These are also from BoxyPixel and they are also made out of aluminum. Super high quality feeling and really comfortable to play on. Now, one thing that you should be aware of is they only come in single color packets. So if you wanna do two colors like I'm doing here, you're gonna have to buy two sets of the buttons. Another thing worth noting is the L and R buttons don't come in that kit. I guess that they're just too difficult to machine, which is understandable. So you're gonna need to either get a set of regular buttons to go along with those. Uh, these ones were sent to me by Handheld Legend, or you may be able to use the ones that come out of the system that you'll be gutting to put inside this shell anyway. I've got a replacement screen from a company called Funny Playing. This was also sent to me by Handheld Legend. This is a gorgeous IPS display with great viewing angles, has a nice glass lens already attached to it for you. And the shell from BoxyPixel is actually designed to use this screen. So you can just drop it in there and it it's perfectly. 
I'm also gonna need a new battery. This one is from Helder. It's 800 milliamp hours, and I've shown this in a previous video. This is a really nice drop-in solution that you don't have to do any soldering or anything like that on. So if you wanna go the easiest route possible, this is a great drop-in solution. But if you're willing to do a little bit of soldering and some extra work, there's this battery from BoxyPixel that is 1700 milliamp hours. So I'll be showing you how to install that as well. But again, if you want an easy drop-in solution, Helder's battery is a great choice. I'm also gonna be using this power switch from Helder. Uh, a lot of these Game Boy Advance SPs, you'll find that the power switches are kind of flaky because they've been turned on and off so many times over the years. So if you happen to find a system like that, and in fact, sometimes you can use that to find a good deal on eBay, this is a great drop-in solution that you can do in just a few minutes to fix that. I'll also show you how to replace an old worn out shoulder button as well. And one more part that I'm gonna be using from Helder, this is his Flex PCB power cleaner. So what this does is it cleans up the power signal that's running through your Game Boy Advance to remove any hissing or popping that you might hear in the speaker, especially from what I hear with some mods uh, like the IPS screen that I'll be putting in. And then this board is called the GB Accelerator. And this is from a group called Division 6. And what it lets you do is over or underclock your Game Boy Advance. And you might be wondering why on earth you'd even wanna do that in the first place, which is a fair question, uh, but there are some legitimate use cases for it. For example, you can speed up the dialogue and grinding in an RPG like Final Fantasy, or to run around and find more random encounters in a game like Pokemon. But you can also underclock it to maybe help you get through a difficult boss fight or something like that. So yeah, I can understand if it doesn't make sense at first, but it's actually pretty cool. I've got a USB type C port. This is one that you can get on Tindy and he even sells them on Amazon. But he actually also has the board designs up on GitHub. So if you wanna download those and make your own boards, you can do that as well. There actually is another option that they kind of expect you to use in the boxy pixel shell, uh, but I'll get to that here in a minute. I'm also going to be adding a headphone jack to it, because believe it or not, the Game Boy Advance SP actually didn't have one of those. You actually had to use a dongle style adapter, kind of like you do on modern iPhones and some Androids as well. And as you can see, the boxy pixel shell already has a hole cut out for that. I'm also going to be adding wireless charging to this, uh, which again, there's a spot cut out in the back of the boxy pixel shell for stuff like this to go in there, uh, which is pretty convenient. There are a couple of caveats to that, but I'll show you those when they come up. I'm also gonna be using a few different parts that I designed and printed out. This one is to hold the headphone jack in place. It lines it up perfectly. You don't need any glue or anything like that. This one blocks the built-in USB type C port since we're not gonna be using that. And then this one is a battery cover that is extended by just a little bit to fit things like the wireless charging module in there. And then I've got some custom light pipes that I printed out in clear resin. Uh, they work pretty well because uh, the original ones actually don't fit. I'll show you that in just a minute. A couple of these do have official versions that you can download off Thingiverse and print out, but these are improved versions that I modeled from scratch, um, and I'll have these up on Patreon for supporters to download and print out if they like, and then I'll be putting them on Thingiverse later on as well. I will also have a set of these available on my shop, uh, so I'll put a link to that in the description as well. So taking it apart is pretty straightforward. Uh, you're just gonna need a Phillips head screwdriver and then one of the tri-wing screwdrivers that Nintendo likes to use on stuff as well. The only thing that you need to watch out for, assuming you don't wanna damage it, is this ribbon cable right here. So just be careful as you're lifting the board up and then unclip it. And there's our 16.78 megahertz ARM processor with 256 kilobytes of RAM next to it. Pretty crazy what they could squeeze out of those. So I'll start with the power switch from Helder. You can see it's got these castellated pins along the edge. Uh, that just means that they don't go all the way around like a full pinhole, uh, which makes it really easy to work with and use as a surface mount component and attach it to a board. So first remove the old switch using some hot air. Should come off pretty easily. Then clean it up, remove any excess solder and flux. Get it nice and clean and ready for the new part. Then the way that I like to do these is add a little bit of solder to one of the pads. Line it up and attach that one pin and double check it and make sure that you've got everything lined up just right. And if that looks good, then you can go down the line and attach the other pins. The ground pads are a little bit difficult to work with, so you may need to hold it down with a pair of tweezers or something, but it's not too bad. And I'll need to go back here and clean up that flux. Uh, but once you're done, you can attach a battery and test it out. And that's it. Like I say, a nice, easy drop-in replacement. Next up is the USB Type-C charging port. 
And I mentioned earlier that there is a board that they kind of expect you to be using in the boxy pixel shell. And that's what this is. And it works just fine. Uh, instead of just being the port itself, it's a whole charging board. And you can see that they have a cutout specifically for this board. So uh, if you wanted to use it, by all means, go right ahead. The thing that I don't like about it is that it doesn't support chargers that use the power delivery protocol. So if you're using a USB Type-C to Type-C cable like this, there's a good chance that it's not gonna work with this board. So you'll have to make sure that you're using a type A to type C cable to guarantee that it'll work. The board that I'm using on the other hand has these tiny resistors right here to let the power delivery protocol know to send five volts and it works just fine. So first we're gonna need to remove this port right here. And the easiest way to do that is to snip both of the shielding legs on either side. Then you can use some hot air to pull it off. Make sure that you heat it up all the way though, because if you look closely here, you can see that I ripped up one of those pads. Uh, so if you're removing this, be more patient than I was, heat it up all the way and make sure that it comes off on its own rather than applying any force to it. Thankfully, we don't need that pad just for the USB Type-C charging. I will need it for something else later on though, and I'll show you that when we come to it. So to get it in just the right spot, you can line up the holes with where those legs were on the board below it. And just like with the power switch, I like to heat one of those up, make sure that it's lined up just right. You can even put it in the shell to double check that it's lined up. And then you can go ahead and attach the other points. The pin that actually carries the power sticks out kind of like a little hook, and you don't need very much solder at all on that one. Go ahead and look at it really closely to make sure that you don't have any bridges with neighboring pads. And then you can go ahead and plug it in and test it out. And next up is the power cleaning board from Helder. And like I mentioned before, what this does is it cleans up the power signal that's going through your Game Boy Advance to hopefully remove any static or hissing that you might hear in the speaker. And it just kind of drops in here like this and you'll add some solder to the top and bottom of both of these capacitors. And then you'll also connect a point on the power switch down here. There's one slight problem though. If you look at the boxy pixel shell, on the back of it, there's this raised part that goes all the way across it. And if you compare that to the original shell, that part just isn't there. What I found when I went to put it together is that actually winds up bumping up against the power cleaning board. And to further complicate things, the GB accelerator board that I'll show you here in a minute is actually meant to go in the same spot as the power cleaning board. So I'm actually gonna have to relocate that onto the front of the board. Thankfully, we're not using that USB charging board. Uh, so I should be able to put it right there. But anyway, more on that in just a minute. So what I ended up doing was sliding it up as far as I possibly could to hopefully make it so that that bar can sit behind the power cleaning board. And it's a little messy looking, but yeah, just slide it up as far as you possibly can. And it should just be able to fit in the shell. Here's what it should look like when you're done. Like I say, you just add some solder to the top and bottom of both of those tiny capacitors and then that one point on the power switch. You'll definitely want to take some Kapton tape or electrical tape or something uh, and cover it up so that it can't come in contact with the metal shell. Next up is the GB Accelerator. So it's got these pads around the edge, one for an LED to let us know what mode it's in, pads to connect to the buttons to change which mode it's in, power and ground, and then this one labeled CLK is gonna be connected to where this crystal is right now. So the first step is to go ahead and remove that. Just apply some hot air until it releases and it should come right off. Now, like I mentioned earlier, I'm gonna to have to position mine on the front of the board uh, because of that bar in the boxy pixel shell and then also because of the power cleaning board. So it's gonna sit right around in this area and I'm attaching it with some double-sided foam tape from Gorilla. Now, if you're putting it here on the front, you may have to play with the positioning a little bit to get it just right. So get it in place, put it in the shell and make sure that it sits flush. Go ahead and tin all of the pads with some solder and the kit should come with a few pieces of colored solid core wire. So that's pretty handy. Now the colors don't matter too much, uh, but I would stick to kind of the standards of using black for ground and red for power. So here's what mine looks like when I'm done. I'm using blue and purple for the buttons, green for the LED, uh, yellow for clock, and then of course, red for power and black for ground. Now there are spots that you can attach the ground wire to all over the board. You can just use a multimeter to find one, uh, but this is what I'm using on mine. And then the power pad is going to attach to this pin on the cartridge port. So if you're holding it in this orientation, it's the leftmost pin. The clock pad is gonna to attach to this pad that the crystal was sitting on. Then the LED is the green wire up here at the top right, and then the purple and the two blue wires are the buttons. Now those go to the select button and then the L and R buttons. And you have to press all of them at once to change the modes, so it actually doesn't matter which pad goes to which button. So here it is at normal speed, and then if I hold L and R and press the select button, 
you can see the power LED blink red once, and that means that it's running at 1.5x speed. And if I do that combination again, you'll see it blink twice. So now it's running at 1.75x, which is pretty nice because it makes it a lot faster to run around and talk to people and things like that. And then if I do it one more time, you can see the power LED kind of fade on and off red. So that means that now it's running at 0.85x, so a little bit slower than full speed. And that could come in handy if you're doing a difficult boss fight or something like that. So now I'm gonna go ahead and replace that R button that's kind of lost its click over the years. This one that you can get on Amazon is a perfect drop-in replacement for it. And for this, you're gonna want at least a desoldering pump or solder sucker as some people call it, so that you can heat up those pins and remove the solder. But even better than that, you can actually get a heated one of those, which is kind of like a hollowed out soldering iron on one end and a desoldering pump on the other end. So you can just put it over each one of those pins, let it melt that solder and then suck it up. You may have to go over each pin a couple of times to get most of it out. And even after doing that, you may have to use a soldering iron to heat up a couple of the pins so that you can pull it out, but it'll get you like 90% of the way there. So then you just drop in the new button, add a little bit of solder to each one of the pins and that's it. So next we're gonna add the headphone jack. And so if you look at this thing, you can see that little tiny piece of metal sticking down into the barrel there. There are a few of those that make contact with these rings on the headphone plug. This first one is ground, next is the right channel, and then the tip is the left channel. So this leg here is ground, and then this one is the right channel, and this one down here is the left channel. Now this leg here on the bottom left actually isn't connected to anything at first, but this tiny piece of metal above it is connected to the ground leg. So when you insert some headphones, that piece of metal gets pushed against that leg, pulling it to ground. That's how the Game Boy Advance will know that you plugged in some headphones so that it can cut off the speaker. So go ahead and tin each of the legs that we're gonna use and attach some wires. Now we're gonna be attaching those wires to some of these pads just below the USB-C port that we added earlier. And remember, I accidentally ripped off one of those pads. Uh, so the corresponding test pad for that one is this one labeled P33 right here. So here's where they each attach. Black is ground. Red is that switch that lets it know when the headphones are plugged in. White is our left channel. And then the green wire is our right channel. So then you can plug in some headphones, power it up, and test it out. And then I modeled this 3D printed part that the headphone jack can just slide down into. And then you can drop it into the shell. Uh, you don't have to use any glue or anything like that. It gets held in place by the other half of the shell holds it in place securely even when you're inserting and removing headphones. Came out really nicely. Now the screen is probably actually the easiest part of this whole build. It comes with this secondary board with a ribbon cable and that attaches to the screen. And this board is what converts the signal from the Game Boy into something that the screen can understand. And as far as the Game Boy is concerned, it thinks that it just has a normal screen plugged into it. The ribbon cable slides into the original connector just make sure that the pins are facing upwards and clip it into place. And then it also comes with this tiny piece of wire. So one end of that is going to connect uh, to this point on the ribbon cable. And the other end of that is gonna connect to this test pad right here. So what that'll do is make it so that the original brightness button on it can control the brightness on the new screen. And really that's about it. You just need to make sure that you connect the screen oriented like this and then you can connect your battery and turn it on and make sure that the brightness button works. This thing gets nice and bright. And like I mentioned earlier, the viewing angles on it are just fantastic. So this is the wireless charging module that I'm using. I can't guarantee that other ones will work well or be safe to use, uh, but this one has been working just fine. So I'll link to this one in the blog post in the description. So the cool thing about these modules is when you put them on a wireless charging pad, they just spit out five volts as if you had something plugged into a USB port. So pretty much anything that can charge over USB can use one of these. Now, as is typical of wireless charging, it's not gonna work uh, through the aluminum battery door. And additionally, it sticks out just enough so that you can't even close it with the aluminum battery door anyway. 
There is a 3D printable one that you can download off of Thingiverse from BoxyPixel, and I had a couple of issues with it. Uh, for one thing, it just didn't fit very well. It was pretty loose in there. But then also, it's just a flat piece that's meant to sit flush. And like I just showed you, since it sticks out just a little bit, I just really wasn't happy with how that original model worked. So I designed and printed my own that gives it a couple of millimeters of extra room to work with in the back there. It of course makes it just a tiny bit thicker, but it adds just enough room in there for the wireless charging module, as well as that extended battery. So in my opinion, it's well worth it. So the module just has two wires coming off of it, one for power and one for ground. Really simple, here's where they connect on that USB type C mod that I installed earlier. So when you put this thing on a wireless charging pad, as far as the Game Boy is concerned, it thinks you just plugged in that power cable. And that's it, we've got wireless charging now. Now as far as the battery is concerned, like I mentioned in the beginning, this one from Helder is a great drop-in solution. So if you don't want to mess with adding connectors to the battery or soldering it directly to the board, or maybe you're not even doing the wireless charging mod so you don't care about that expanded battery compartment, this is a great option. Now it does sit pretty loose in the battery base, so if you're going to be using this one, you probably want to add something in there to press it up against the battery connector. But I'm going to go ahead and use this just so I can show you how to do it. As you can see, the ends of the wires connected to it are bare. They don't have any kind of connector or anything, and we're going to need to connect them to both of these pins right here. The one on top is ground, and the one below it is power. The problem though is that if you attach the battery directly to this, you won't have any way to quickly disconnect it if you need or want to, uh, and it's going to make getting it inside the shell pretty difficult. So I'm going to go ahead and add some JST connectors. You can get these from Adafruit, I'm sure there are other places as well. And I'm going to attach the female side of it to these battery pads. And then we'll go ahead and splice the male side onto the battery. I like to use heat shrink tubing to make sure that it doesn't short against anything. And you'll probably want to keep everything pretty short so that you can fit everything inside the battery bay. And that's it. So now we'll be able to feed that connector through the battery door to easily connect and disconnect it. So I popped in the Metroid Fusion cartridge and let it run its demo loop and did a few different battery tests. Using the 1700 milliamp hour battery at full brightness, I got about 6.75 hours. Then I did the same test at minimum brightness and I got a whopping 15.5 hours, which is just insane. Then I put in an 800 milliamp hour battery uh, and I got about 5.5 hours at full brightness so I'm not quite sure how to explain that one. I expected it to be, you know, roughly half of what the 1700 milliamp hour battery got. And for reference, here's a test that I did a little while ago. Uh, this is a stock AGS 101 using Helder's battery and I got about 11 hours doing the same test. So when it came time to put everything back together, a couple more of those minor issues with the boxy pixel shell that I mentioned uh, wound up coming up. So first of all, these springs that push the L and R buttons out, the original shell has these tiny hooks that stick out behind the battery bay to hold one end of those springs. Those are missing from the boxy pixel shell, and I'm assuming it has to do with how difficult those would be to machine, so it's kind of understandable. The workaround for that is to take that end of the spring and just kind of tuck it behind the battery bay. So far, it's been holding just fine in mind, uh, and you can't really tell a difference in the way that it it feels either. So not a huge deal at all, but definitely worth pointing out. The next is this piece of metal shielding on the cartridge slot. The screws that come with the boxy pixel shell are all the same size and the heads of them are just too thick so the board just can't sit flush inside of the shell. I ended up finding a screw that I had on hand that's much flatter that I was able to use for it, uh, but again, something worth calling out. If you don't have a screw that'll fit, then you might need to either forego this or glue it into place or something like that. Now, since I wasn't using that USB Type-C charging board, I modeled up and printed out a blocker for that port so that there wasn't a hole sitting there. There is one from BoxyPixel, but you'll have to glue it into place. Uh, so I came up with this one that just slides in there, doesn't need any glue or anything like that. The next issue that I ran into was the light pipes for the charging indicator LEDs. I assumed that I'd be able to just pull the one out of the original shell and stick it in there. And it kind of looks like it should fit, but it doesn't. Like, not at all. I even tried like chopping it in half so that there were individual light pipes that I could stick down in there, just could not get it to work. So once again, I wound up modeling my own, printing them out on a resin printer so that they're nice and clean looking and they're transparent. It wound up working really well. Now, as you're putting it together, you probably need to mess with the placement of some of these wires uh, to make sure that they're not in the way of the buttons or the silicone pads or anything like that. And the BoxyPixel shell, as I mentioned, is designed to work with the screen, so you can just drop it in there without any modifications, as if you'd even be able to modify the aluminum shell very well. And once you get all the guts mounted in there, it's a good idea to turn it on and make sure that everything still works. So far, so good. 
So one last issue with the shell that I need to point out. Uh, on mine, I don't know if it just had to do with the placement of my board or what, but the power switch wasn't able to move quite far enough to turn it on. And so I measured the opening on the BoxyPixel shell and it measured right at 13 millimeters. And then the original shell measured 13.3 millimeters, which doesn't sound like much of a difference at all, but it was just enough that uh, mine wasn't able to turn on all the way. So on mine, the fix for that was just to shave off the right side of this part that sticks out just a little bit. And that gives it just enough extra room so that it works. You want to slide the wireless charging module through this slot and then the battery JST connector in the smaller hole. Make sure that everything fits in there nice and flush. Now the wireless charging module comes with this little magnetic sticker that you can put on the side of the coil that'll be facing the Game Boy, and that'll kind of act as shielding between uh, the charging coil and everything behind it. Definitely you'll want to put either some Kapton tape or some electrical tape around this part so that it doesn't come in contact with the metal shell. Once you put it on there, you can trim it down to size if you need to. And here's that 3D printed battery bay extender that I mentioned earlier. And there it is. So as you hopefully saw, none of these mods individually are very difficult at all. And honestly, even though it took me a few weeks to put this video together, you could knock out all of these mods in a single evening if you wanted to. All right, guys, well, I think that about covers everything. Uh, if I forgot anything or if I need to correct anything, I'll do it in that blog post that I linked to in the description. Uh, so definitely check that out. that will also have the list of all of the parts and tools that I'm using as well. Huge thanks to my Patreon supporters, as usual. I really appreciate you guys. I know that I haven't been very active at all this year, either on here or on Instagram, really. Um, honestly, I just kind of needed a little bit of a mental break. Uh, spent some more time with family, had a lot of work stuff going on and things like that. Uh, but as you can see, I'm starting to get back into it. I've got some other videos and projects lined up. So keep an eye out for those, and I will see you guys next time.